morning. Welcome to those of you watching and to the candidates this morning. My name is Kristen Malone and I'm co-president of League of Women Voters of Glen Ellen along with Erica Nelson. Thank you for joining us for this District 89 School Board Candidates Forum. This year, there are four open school district um, board positions and six candidates on the ballot. Voters will cast for up to four, they'll cast a vote for up to four candidates. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. We encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. The League works to increase understanding of the major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Although challenged by this, the pandemic, for the past 12 months, we have innovated and continued the League's mission of empowering voters and defending democracy, including hosting candidate forums this past fall. And we are pleased to host today's voter information events. The format is virtual. So we ask that candidates and viewers eliminate distractions and give the forum their undivided attention so they would be um, available to view this as an in-person event. Our moderator this morning is Barbara Young. Ms. Young is a member of the League of Women Voters of the LaGrange area. She is a partner in the Chicago law firm of Golan, Christie and Taglia where she practices in the area of business law, bankruptcy, and commercial litigation. Barbara is also an active member of many women's rights organizations. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you so much for moderating this forum for us today. Thank you, Kristen. Good morning. It's an honor for me to be moderating today's candidates forum. I would like to begin by reviewing some of the league ground rules for candidate forums. All candidates have signed and returned the ground rules. These rules specify the format, time limits, and other rules related to conducting the forum. I will be responsible for enforcing these rules. The candidates will begin in alphabetical order <clears throat> with their opening statements. They will alternate the order in which they answer questions. And after the question portion of the forum, each candidate will have time for a closing statement. Each candidate will be given two minutes for their opening statements, one minute to respond to each question, and one minute for their closing statement. Their responses will be timed, as you will see on the screen. The questions have been gathered in advance from the public. A panel of experienced league members has reviewed the questions submitted and carefully screened them for appropriateness for this office and to avoid duplication. The event today is being recorded. The League claims copyright ownership of any recording or transcript of the forum. The forum will be posted in its entirety on the League's website, social media platforms, and the Illinois Voter Guide. Any other use of the forum recording requires the express written approval of the league. Audio and video must be broadcast unedited and in its entirety, except by media reporting on the event. Finally, I wanna emphasize how grateful we are to these candidates who are not only willing to serve in office, but who have agreed to participate in this morning's forum. Now I'm asking the candidates, please start your video and turn on your audio. And we're gonna begin with opening statements. And our first candidate this morning is Katie Benning. And as a reminder, you have two minutes. So welcome. Good morning. Again, thank you for having us this Saturday morning. Um, I am so excited to be here and to share my opinions and views and why I think that you should vote and cast your vote for me. Um, first, I wanna say vote locally is very important and I wanna make sure that at the end of the day, voting for your local school board or your county representatives or your township run, um, representatives is so important. So please get out there and vote. Um, I have been a member of Glen Ellen for four years. My family relocated here from out of state um, I have two children in the school district, both at Briar Glen School, one in fourth grade and one in first grade. 
My husband and I are also foster parents and help develop um, relationships with helping parents who are struggling um, get reunited with their um, children. Um, my professional experience involves over 15 years of executive leadership and financial services and essential frontline workers. So I have had that experience through the pandemic managing and making decisions that have helped um, maintain that banks stay open and we do protect our employees at the same time as well as our customers. Um, why am I running? I'm running because I really think that we need um, to have community involvement that is someone that is going to help the recovery of the post pandemic. We are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I wanna make sure that that future, when those children go back to school full time, that we are giving them the resources they need to be successful. I believe that we really need to be focused on the mental health of the children as they return, as well as the teachers, as they have all experienced individual traumas, being at home for extended period of time, lack of socialization, and making sure that we are building resilient children for the future and the next generation. I also think that I want transparency in the community. When we make decisions, we need to explain the why behind. And then finally, fiscal responsibility, where are taxpayers' money going? Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite candidate Kemp to make her opening statement. Hi, good morning. Thank you for hosting. I'm Donna Kemp, a mom of two at Parkview with my youngest in first grade. And like many parents, we moved here for the high rated schools and teachers, knowing that our top dollar taxes would mean uh, the best education for our kids. And with my own background in teaching extensively in special ed, you know, I understand the joys and challenges that teachers face on a daily basis. And I recognize the enormous tasks that teachers have been dealing with in this pandemic and the world being turned on its side. And that's really what prompted me to wanna to be a voice for both parents and teachers. And I feel like with my background in business, that's helped me handle ups and downs, learn how to overcome obstacles, engage in problem solving, engage in critical thinking outside the box. Having been a Girl Scout and a three sport athlete, I feel like that's instilled a team player attitude in me. And I've really learned to embrace different strengths that people bring to the table while at the same time working as a team towards a common goal. I, I understand the, the benefits of extra, extracurricular activities for our kids. And you know, on my flyer cards or signs, you'll see my slogan, clarity, equity, and unity. And what I mean by clarity is really having a clear mission of serving 100% of our students with a full educational experience and parent choice. And for equity, that's really providing an equal opportunity for all our students to access a quality learning environment that's fair and impartial. And for unity, that's really just taking a unified approach um, to represent the public interests out there. We have taxpaying residents, we have parents, we have caretakers, we have community members that are really involved. And we need to do represent that while collaborating with the other stakeholders of teachers and district administrators. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jay Lurch. Welcome. Good. Thank you, good morning. And thank you to League of Women Voters for the invitation to this morning's forum. Um, I believe it's important for the public to see and hear from the local candidates. Um, the past four years has presented many challenges for our district. Uh, we addressed the school boundary issues and developed a solution based on the input from population experts, the community, family, staff, and the board. We now have a district without overcrowded classrooms. Then it was time to face the budget challenge. We used the same approach and fully engaged the community in the Yes for 89 referendum campaign. I joined others in the district community knocking on doors to get the vote out, and it passed. Uh, the district is now able to rebuild its fund balances and will be able to grow our programs well into the future. Now we are in what I hope is the tail end of a pandemic and the entire district community has really shown how resilient we are in the face of this very difficult time. The district will continue to follow the science and work hard to protect the health and safety of all the students, staff and families with the goal of safely returning to all day in-person learning. We all work together in this community. That's how we get things done. 
now and moving forward. I am part of this community. I'm a parent of a wonderful fifth grader at Arborview. Um, I serve on the Arborview Parent Teacher Council and, um, uh, and I'm a watchdog dad. I volunteer locally through my church and I'll be an assistant coach on my son's baseball team this year. The D89 board is recognized as one of the best in the area. On the school board, I'm an active and um, engaged member and have been part of the community engagement, the finance committee, uh, the building committee and the policy review committee. Um, thank you again for the League of Women Voters for the opportunity to discuss my views on good school board governance and the amazing future of D89. Okay, now Stephen Neurouter, I invite you to make your opening statement. Hi, um, also thank you for, to the League of Women Voters for hosting the event. Um, uh, my wife and I moved here with our three kids uh, almost five years ago because of our district's good schools. Uh, I have a fourth grader, a second grader, and a kindergartner, and I'm helping them all with remote learning while my wife works full-time job and I run my own business. Uh, I know well uh, how hard this past year has been. I am running because I want to make sure the board makes the right decisions so the district continues to be great through and after the pandemic. I'm a small business owner who creates business strategies for many different types of clients from mental health counselors looking to grow their businesses to large aerospace defense contractors. I also have years of experience advising the government. I created government policy, I have negotiated large contracts, and I've overseen these contracts operations. I learned about the district and its finances when I volunteered for the Citizens Advisory Council and Finance Committees. I learned about the community when I spoke with hundreds of community members and knocked on over a thousand doors to keep our district schools great. I know how, how the district runs and I know how diverse the community is. I think the two components that make a school board member, that make a good school board member is understanding and experience. Board members have to understand how the board operates. They need to understand its relationship with the district. They need to understand the needs of the community that make up the district. And they need to understand that public education truly means equitably educating all of our students. Board members need to have experience with the district. They need to have experience setting strategy and policy. They need to have experience analyzing contracts and operations. And they need to know how to work with people to, uh, to uh, collaborate and they need to have experience making adjustments with new information that is brought forward. A school board member does the same things I've done in my career and I understand the community, I understand the district, I understand the board's role and I'm running with this understanding and its experience to make sure the district and its award-winning board stays on track and continues its excellent academic track record. Thank okay. you. And our next candidate, Heidi Nunez, welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Heidi Nunez. Um, I am currently serving as the District 89 Board Vice President, and I've had the honor of serving the board for the past six years. I was appointed to the position in 2015 and reelected in 2017, um, and uh, currently also serving as a member of the Policy Committee. And I truly enjoy that role as I feel strongly that policy is the voice of the board and I enjoy that role. I too have three children in District 89 um, and as all of you and all of our viewers um, have been right along with you uh, with dealing with the past year of uh, uncertainty and changes um, and uh, working through uh, the different iterations of what education and life has looked like the past the past year. I've had the pleasure, and I truly say pleasure, of working on uh, working with a strong board that's collaborative, um, with whom I trust, with my uh, most precious assets as well, my children. Um, I have complete trust in the way that we work together, the way that we make decisions. Um, this, these are not just my opinions, of course. We have a really strong legacy of financial stability and being responsible with our community's um, resources and assets. We have great recognition for our strong governance. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, strong recognition of the way that the board governs itself um, and uh, ensures that we are following uh, the laws and the regulations as well as guidelines as well. It would be my honor and my pleasure to continue to serve uh, on the board and continue on with the strong academic achievement and fiscal responsibility for which District 89 is known for. Thank you. Hey. And our final candidate, Lavanya Sridhar. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Thanks. Uh, thank you to the League, uh, League of Women Voters uh, for this opportunity. 
I just wanted to take this time to share a bit about myself and uh, as an incumbent, also some of the uh, kind of journey I've been on on the board for the past three years to really deliver uh, education for students. Uh, briefly about myself, I have been in the community for the past 17 years and I have one son who is a sophomore at Glenbard South and who has been a beneficiary of a awesome school district right from preschool through elementary and uh, middle school. And so for me, um, this is truly my thank you back to the community and really delivering and providing my kind of service back to the school district and uh, in a thankful way. I've also been part of uh, multiple boards in Glen Ellen as part of um, Teen Parent Connection and the Glen Ellen Juniors. And I, I totally dedicate myself to community. That's one uh, key pillar of uh, what I do. Uh, from a board perspective, as Jay and Heidi men uh, mentioned, we are a very strong, collaborative, high-performing board, and I'm super thankful for the opportunity to be there. For me, uh, my philosophy uh, is for uh, really empowering all the students, really ensuring that we recognize and optimize their potential. And I've really kept that as a value to really being a comprehensive, collaborative and really keeping an eye on the changing landscape. So going forward as uh, if I'm reelected, I will continue to really maintain the high standards of the board, think about all uh, students, help the families and the community through the pandemic, and also ensure that we are maintaining the fiscal stability for a long-term high performing uh, school district. So I really look forward to answering your questions and um, building my case for my candidacy for re-election. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna move into the question and answer phase. And uh, Donna, I'd ask you to unmute yourself. We're gonna start with you. Number one, how will you solicit parental and community feedback? How often and how will you use the information you receive if it conflicts with your own opinion? Okay, thank you. Um, as far as soliciting parent feedback, and uh, you know, I view that as really engaging our community, right? We, our community has very strong voices out there. We're a diverse community. So you know, everyone has differing views and opinions on what's the best way to handle something, but all of those opinions and views are valuable and valid. And I think you know, one thing our, our district has done is surveys but I feel like there needed to be a second part to that step. So get handing out the surveys is one thing, but then the follow-up, making sure the follow-up and the actions that are taken are aligned with the results. If we do surveys, we need to make sure that the, the results are aligned with the actual results of those surveys. And I feel like there needs to be more of um, more opportunities for communicating and engaging the community, whether that's a town hall style type of meeting or just having our board meetings be more accessible where they can have questions can be answered. Okay, candidate Lurch, how will you solicit parental and community feedback? How often, how will you use it? Even if it conflicts with your own opinion? Well, I mean, the, the job of a school board candidate is to connect with the community. Um, it reminds me of when we were doing the um, the, the yes for 89, because Steve's got it on his wall, the yes for 89, when we had uh, the entire lunchroom at Glencrest was filled with parents who were concerned about, you know, the referendum and, and increase the possible increase to their taxes. And so we got their feedback. We, we, we engaged experts. We engaged uh, members of the community who didn't have kids in the district. We man, uh, all the families and, um, and we really, addressed everybody's concerns. And, and even if they didn't agree, you know, we, we had breakout rooms, we sat and we talked and we discussed and we have an open mind. That's our job. That's the school board member's job is to have an open mind and present the opinions of the people that are in the district and to kind of work with the other school board members and, uh, and come to a consensus. That's, that's really what we do. We, we provide opinions, we discuss those options and we come to a consensus. Okay. Thank you. Candidate New Router, your thoughts? So um, I think um, uh, the, the district already does uh, have uh, several panels that, that parents and community members um, uh, engage in and, and 
work together uh, coming up with uh, um, uh, gathering everybody's input. So I, I'd like to see that continue. I was on a few of those boards. That's how I ended up going into the finance committee and the community engagement group. Um, and then I ended up uh, co-leading the Yes for 89 campaign. So um, uh, I think you have to do it um, at, um, uh, you have to adjust how often you do it based on the, the needs at the time. And uh, I think my opinion is, is only one of the many community members in the, in, in the group community. So, so, so my opinion um, isn't, isn't as, as important as, as the group's uh, input. And so um, I think there are things we can do. We need to uh, uh, explain things better a little bit, I think, to the community, maybe a dashboard like the one that District 200 has as far as uh, the next steps for dealing with major issues like the pandemic. Okay, candidate Nunez, your thoughts on this issue? Yes, um, communication, input, and feedback is critical in all aspects of the of the education operation um, here. And some of the things that I would um, strongly recommend is leveraging what we already do really well. We have some great strengths in communication and, and uh, community involvement in the work that we do beyond compliance, right? Because the the board. Um, uh, operates in the public. And this is one of the ways that we solicit uh, um, comment from the public. One of the things that we've done that has uh, been really well accepted um, is to uh, hold that virtually as well, which has been a great benefit to the public. But beyond compliance, there are a number of ways that parents and community um, can get involved and have been very involved in committees. Every time we have um, a new initiative coming on board, such as the referendum, we will have a, an upcoming strategic plan um, coming up. So there's always opportunities for parental involvement, as well as direct communication over email to uh, administration and the board and getting involved in your, in your building as well. Okay, thank you. Candidate Sridhar, your views on soliciting the views of the public? I think it's very, very crucial. I cannot reiterate that. We absolutely need community, parents, um, and staff. I almost look at all of them being really three key pillars of great student education and learning. So the administration staff, the board, the community, and uh, the parents. Um, I feel really proud uh, that we have definitely kept every opportunity and every option open for uh, different folks in the community and parents. And I've been myself part of multiple brainstorming sessions and open forums for people to provide their perspective. I think it is super critical. And as a board member, I will continue to push on driving that and ensuring that their voices are heard. And also just, uh, I sit on the district leadership council, which is a combination of teachers and staff exactly to be listening and bringing their voice to the board and doing the same thing uh, with parents. And I've been on many committees right from the boundary change, financial, and also the strategic plan to really hear the voices and bring it to the table. Okay, same question, candidate Benning. Yeah, I think that the district has done a good job of getting community involvement through parent committees. Um, what I would say is we need to be more transparent of how to sign up for those, be more vocal in the newsletters, um, really have that front and center. Um, I think we've seen in this pandemic, several community leaders, parents, teachers have opinions and not everybody knows where they can go to be a part of the solution. So I would really advocate that we have our website and more um, newsletters of where you can sign up, where you can get involved and how you can have your voices heard. I also think we should really have an importance on listening sessions with our teachers, given this pandemic and making sure that they feel supported and ensuring that they um, stay with us for the long term. Finally, my opinion is not gonna be my opinion. I'm here to serve the community. Um, I currently voice the opinion of my 150 employees. That's what I would continue to do is voice the opinion of my community, my parents and the stakeholders that are involved. Okay, and now we move on to the second question beginning with candidate Lurch. How would you build positive relationships with the administration, union, parent committees, the PTA, the community, and your fellow board members? Well, we really do have a strong system that's already in place where we, where we, where we have, uh, like Law mentioned, we have the DLC, uh, the leadership committee. And so we have direct communication um, through the superintendent 
uh, to the school teachers. Um, we have the, the we have so many uh, newsletters, and the website is just you know anybody who thinks that you know the board isn't transparent can really just go right to the website and find literally everything we've ever done uh, right there, all the way down to the last penny that we spent um, in the finances. So I mean, there really is a lot of transparency. We do have a lot of communication already, and I'd just like to continue that uh, that strong. Uh, legacy of uh, getting involved with the community and uh, continuing that open communication. Okay, candidate New Router, your thoughts on building relationships? Yeah, so I think um, one major important is, is you, uh, important thing is that you have to build trust. Um, and I think um, as people uh, do engage with the district, as I did, um, that's that's really where I built my trust in the district, and and knowing that that um, that they they really do. Um, uh, good things and making sure that, that the focus is on making sure the kids are safe and educated very well. So um, I, would uh, I would build that trust. Um, I want to uh, build relationships by, by meeting with the different groups that you mentioned, listening to what they have to say, uh, engaging with, with difficult conversations sometimes, and really um, documenting everybody's inputs so that um, it would be um, useful for the rest of the board for for me to relay or for one of the other board, board members to relay that to me um, so that everybody really is on the same footing and 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 has the same trust in in the board and the district okay same question candidate nunez yes we are a people organization and whenever we're talking about people relationships are important and I think that it, this goes back to your previous question, right? How do you develop a strong relationship? And it begins with good communication. Um, so making sure that we are sharing information in a regular way through newsletters, the website, um, and other uh, communication avenues, but also having those uh, avenues as we discussed in the previous question for information uh, and feedback to flow up as well. I think one of the most important things that we've done um, as, a, as a board is to make sure that we are um, providing all stakeholders an opportunity for communication, including our most important stakeholder, our students. So now having two student uh, board members at the board provides us an additional opportunity to have more input, more feedback, um, and really ensuring that all of our stakeholders um, have the opportunity to um, share their input and develop even stronger relationships. Okay, candidate Sridhar, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I definitely, I think um, my, one of my goals is the collaborative culture uh, across all uh, groups. And as Jay and Heidi had mentioned, you know, definitely we have achieved a really strong uh, perspective from a board to engage every stakeholder, uh, communicate uh, as much as possible and uh, lis listen as much as possible, uh, connecting with the, PTCs, connecting with the community, uh, different forums. And so I think we would want to continue that and really maintain that relationship. And I think it is critical. The trust is critical where people re recognize and realize that whatever we do is for the long-term success of uh, the board uh, from a school perspective and for the students. At the end of the day, the board is as successful as what we drive to the students. So I think it is super important that we maintain that and we have uh, keep our listening ears on and uh, continue to focus on what's right for all our students. All right, candidate Benning, your thoughts on building positive relationships. Yeah, um, when you build a relationship, it really becomes the foundation is trust and how to get trust is to do what you say. So if we're gonna do something and we're gonna um, be as a board and have our voice, we need to follow through with that. And if we have to change and adjust as long as we've had to, the board has had to as the pandemic has gone along, we need to make sure that in our communication, uh -huh. we are explaining the why the how behind the how this decision was made so that all stakeholders, the teachers, the students, the parents, the community knows what we are doing and why. Um, besides just, and that's how you build trust is do what you say. I also think a really important part of that is follow, um, communication and in communication, not only just newsletters, but really making sure that from a voice standpoint, there's regular communication that is easy to understand and that is equitable to all parties. All right, and finally, candidate Kemp. Yes, 
I think, you know, one of the main things is our core value. One of our core values for the district is having that partnership with home, school, community. I think that's an area we need to focus on rebuilding and strengthening that. Um, I, I know from being a teacher that there's, you know, it's crucial to have our amazing teachers have their voice being heard and their input being validated. I know there's you know, there's good and bad from being involved in a, in a union, but we need to reach out and reach across and make sure we're handling that, what's going on with that as well. We need to be involved with the, the parent teacher co committees. We need to, you know, be encouraging diverse discussions and dialogue, that constant communication, being proactive problem solvers, not reactive, and having that open outreach. Um, you know, we formed committees, but really how are these committees being formed? Are they open to all, anyone and all, or are they handpicked? And so I feel like we need to really make sure that we're giving access to everyone. Okay, thank you. Now we're gonna move on to question three and begin with candidate New Router. What is the most important issue facing District 89? Um, right now, <laughs> um, the pandemic, I think, uh, you know, when I first uh, uh, got involved with the, the district, it was finances and making sure we had enough money to go forward. And I'm really happy now uh, that we did pass that because we'd be in a really tough spot uh, dealing with the pandemic if we hadn't. Um, but I think right now the pandemic and getting through it and getting you know, focusing on getting uh, all the kids back in school uh, like normal as soon as possible. And to me, that means it has to be safe for the kids and teachers. Uh, you have to adjust with new information. You can't just go forward. You have to listen to the, te uh, the, the schools, uh, uh, the teachers and uh, the kids, uh, the parents, because um, each parent needs something different. Um, so when you have a third of the district still not going into school for even a hybrid model, you have to listen to them and make sure that whatever you do is within your resources and uh, you make sure that you focus on things like mental health and kids' education throughout. Okay, candidate Nunez, your thoughts on the most important issue. Sure. Right now we have an immediate and urgent uh, need in front of us, which we will be responding to, we are responding to, um, and we'll continue to work on um, in uh, understanding what, what fall will look like for all students. So this is, um, you know, critical and urgent for us to focus on that um, right now. So I also want to share that uh, my life's work and passion and what I've been um, really focused on here in District 89 is um, access. Uh, we've talked about equity here, access, equitable access to education um, and student success. And one of the things that we've been working on in District 89 as a result of the equity audit that we've been working on for the past couple of years um, really is disaggregating where that what that achievement looks like. We are a high performing, high achieving school district and we um, wanna make sure that that um, achievement is equitably representative, re representative across all of our demographics. Um, so beyond our urgent and critical needs, equity and achievement is, uh, in my opinion, uh, our most critical issue. Okay, and we'll move to candidate Sridhar, your thoughts on the most important issue. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think a uh, few of the candidates ahead of, uh, before me had said it is getting the students uh, what they need to su be successful during the pandemic and post pandemic. So I think uh, we are definitely focusing on how we continue to provide the comprehensive, education curriculum, so, uh, social emotional learning for all our students uh, through the pandemic remote and students who are coming in for hybrid. And also while ensuring that we maintain our fiscal uh, stability through this. And I, um, and I think we have done with the referendum that was passed, we have the ability to provide the best in class uh, curriculum for our students uh, and um, really getting them to be full, thinking about full students versus just their academic. I think that's been the focus and will be, will continue to be our focus um, going forward. And as we will be getting back on March 22nd, you know, we will definitely get the students back um, as best as we can, and then make sure that we get back full time uh, in the fall, in the new school year. All right, candidate Benning, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing we really need to know is, first of all, the CDC has continued to change their guidelines. And I know that's frustrating to everyone, especially every industry out there. We're constantly have to change in education. But what I see is with these children, they need more time in school and they need a refocus on mental health. I think the one thing that we have learned from the pandemic, it's not all about academic achievement. It's making a well-rounded child and that next generation. So a focused, renewed on not only social, emotional, learning, but are we testing and making sure that their mental health is tested like we are testing mathematics and reading? Are we using the resources out there to ensure that we are getting in front of the mental stability of our children, as well as the mental health that the teachers are coming back from? They've been asked to do two jobs, teach remote students and in person this year. That has been a lot of action stress. What have we done to support them and give them the resources they need to be successful, even going back into the fall? Okay, candidate Kemp. So I think there's, there's, there's so many issues, right, that we could put in the forefront. And I, we obviously know that teachers and students, they're, they're the forefront in our mind and they're the forefront in who we want to take care of and address. And I, I know this is a highly rated school district and we want to keep it that way. You know, I, I know our superintendent is someone who believes that, you know, our, our kids need to be challenged. They need to love learning. We need, but I feel like we need to reinvigorate that love for learning because I feel like the disruptive to the disruption to their learning time has kind of allowed things to dip in that area. And, you know, we want to encourage our kids to think outside the box, to understand that it's okay to take risks. I feel like our, our school has done a good job. We have five to six layers of mitigation. We can, I believe we can safely return to, to, to in-person instruction. I really want to push for our, that full educational experience. And I know that there are more than just a few reasons why people have chosen to do full remote. And I think it goes- All right, beyond. thank you. Thank you. We got to move on. Candidate Lurch, what do you think is the most important issue facing the district? You know, when, when I heard this question and then I, I, I realized Heidi was going to go in front of me, this happens all the time at board meetings where she says exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> and so it happens all the time. Of course, we have to address the pandemic. Um, we're on the tail end of it. So we've got so we've, we've, we've done so much hard work. And I believe in the fall, we'll be able to safely get those families uh, back in school who choose to do so. Um, but, but moving forward, I mean, every time we have a hurdle, we get over it. We can't just look at that hurdle and, 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 and deal with that. We have to go forward. That's why in the middle of this pandemic, we had an equity audit. You know, um, our teachers aren't representative of the community and we need to do a better job of making sure that we hire more teachers who look like our students in the class. And, and, and in the leadership. And so I think that's the next thing that's gonna be important. We're gonna get past the pandemic. We need to work on uh, the equity and uh, making sure that the staff and the leadership in the district uh, represent the community. All right, thank you. Now we're gonna move on to the next question, beginning with candidate Nunez. How will you personally be transparent to all stakeholders within the community? Great. Well, um, exactly the way I've been uh, performing the past six years. Um, first of all, uh, staying true to the core values, the mission, um, and the strategic plan that we've set forth with the community, um, establishing those goals, making those uh, public and available, uh, and including the community uh, in that in those decision making uh, processes to set those goals. Um, also, continuing to lead with um, integrity. As I mentioned before, the policy is the uh, voice of the board. So making sure that we're consistent with the policies and the core values that we've set forth from the, from the beginning um, and making sure that we're sharing information in a timely fashion and ensuring that we're reaching out um, for feedback uh, on those important issues that we're working on in the moment. Okay, candidate Sridhar, your thoughts on transparency. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, it's a core tenant of the board. And, you know, I definitely believe that we will continue that. And I think through the pandemic, uh, we have learned that we need to continue to push that and really share all our decision making. And we've done, I, I think, a pretty good job of really putting 
all the information, everything we have collected um, and you know, uh, for the community to look at, the parents to look at. And also I think transparency is also for me as being a board member, really asking those uh, questions that we have heard, if that is not being put out and being really responsible about that. So I, I do believe transparency is a core tenant. It's a core value. And you know, we'll continue to do that both at the board meeting, but also you know, uh, as we connect with various community members listening and bringing those questions back to the board and back to the district leadership. Okay, thank you. Candidate Benning, how will you personally be transparent to all the stakeholders? Yeah, I think um, transparency is such a crucial key in building trust with the community, with the stakeholders, with the union. Um, I believe we can do that when we start to, we listen more and talk less and having empathetic, um, you leading with empathy through all of this and understanding everybody's coming from a different situation and being able to push that forward to be the voice of the community. Um, that's how you get transparency. Also, again, the follow through, right? Making sure that whatever we say we're going to do, we are executing on it um, and making sure that's how you have a transparent and you know where everyone stands. Um, gaining the respect with um, listening to others and especially those teachers and the um, community and making sure that again, your personal opinion is not getting in the way of your role and your service. Okay, candidate Kemp. Yes. You know, our board meetings, um, they're, they're open meetings to the public, but I would like to see them be more accessible because as I mentioned before, you know, parents can show up and express in a statement format what they're concerned about or what they're worried about or what's important to their own personal values and for their family. And it's not, there's no way for them to get their questions answered. And there are meeting minutes posted. Our, our district has always done a wonderful job at that. But I feel like there could also be a, a better summary of what was discussed and what was finalized as a result of those meetings being held. So I want to see more accessibility, more of an open dialogue, more of active listening, more proactive mindset. So all of these things are what I'm looking to you know, incorporate or help find a way. I want to meet in the middle, work on that common ground and really have a true sense of collaboration so that we are accurately representing our diverse communities. Okay, candidate Lurch, your thoughts on this? So when you, when you talk about personal transparency, I really believe that it comes down to being involved in the community, being a member, being accessible. Um, you know, I volunteer uh, as a watchdog dad. So I get to spend a day uh, in the school helping uh, all the different classrooms uh, with the teachers. I, uh, I get to do a lot of reading and, and checking tests. But uh, the unique position I get as a member of the board is that they also get to go and, um, and read to the kids uh, sometimes um, in the schools, of course, before the pandemic. But um, being accessible, um, you know, I, I'm volunteering this year as an assistant baseball coach. Uh, on my son's uh, uh, baseball team. So you have to be out there. You have to be accessible. You have to be involved uh, and you have to talk to people. And that's what I'm good at. Okay, candidate New Router. Um, so I think um, one thing to keep in mind and it's, it's difficult um, to, to do as a board member, but um, you know, there, there are specific rules for that all board, all school boards need to follow. And it's, and it's based in legal uh, for re legal reasons. So, so I understand, um, uh, you know, the push for transparency, but not, um, but you, you have to think about it in that context, you know, you can only share what's legally, what you can legally share. So I think for transparency, um, meeting with the teachers and the PTCs and the community more would help with that. Um, making sure, uh, information on the website and maybe even, um, describing the process of decision-making and, um, uh, uh, making sure that's on the, on the website. I think that would help as well um, uh, to, to ensure people trust that the school district is being transparent, which they already are. All right, now we're gonna move to the next question, um, beginning with candidate Sridhar. How soon should all students return to school full-time? What specific challenges are there in having the students return to school full-time in 2021-2022 and give examples of how you would address these challenges. 
Absolutely, I see three three different questions in there, Barbara. So let me try to break sure. them down, um, each of them. I, I think your question, uh, I'm assuming when you say 20, 21, 22, it's for the fall <laughs> school district, correct? I think yeah, so. I th yeah. Okay, thank you. I think that it, it is critical. Um, I think uh, we, we are already starting the journey, coming, getting our students back in, you know, starting March 22nd. And like I said, we truly believe that we've been watching the C CDC guidelines. We've been listening to the community, the parents, and we all believe that, you know, coming back and giving them, uh, getting us back is definitely important. The challenges will be around the vaccinations um, and getting community safety uh, in mind and the teachers' health and safety in mind, and also making sure that the students are able to uh, come back and be consistent, right? So I think why we make all these decisions uh, is that we want to keep consistent education for our students. We don't want to be pulling. So I would see those are my challenges if ensuring that the, uh, everybody is vaccinated, the community is safe, and the students, you know, there's clarity of uh, them coming back uh, full time and staying that way for a long period of time. All right, candidate Benning. Yeah, the CDC guidelines and state guidelines have just changed from six feet to three feet. Um, we, I think we saw the announcement yesterday that District 87, the high school is going back on April 5th, um, full day, five days a week. Um, I know that 85% of our teachers are fully vaccinated at this point. I know that we've spent the money on the ventilation systems. We have the UV cleaning systems. We have a school nurse in every um, school. We have all the resources available. I believe the kids are ready to go back and they should go back now. I think that we didn't know what we were up against, but now that the studies have come out, whether it be from Harvard, multiple uh, thousands of school districts around the country, our children deserve that option at this point to come back, knowing that we have protected our staff. We have put together a plan of metrics in the summertime to be ready for it, and we should be of that option. The people that want to stay home and they want to protect their kids because they have elderly or whatever their circumstances are, they should still have the option to be full remote as well as just come in the video learning. Okay. Thank you. Candidate Kemp? Yes. So this is an important question, um, I think, to many, many parents right now. How soon our kids should return to, to full time? I believe as soon as possible. Uh, the sooner, the better. Um, I was hoping for right, you know, right now and even right after spring break. We, we are increasing our hours um, by two hours, but I feel like there are enough, again, there are enough layers of mitigation in place. The numbers have been dropping. You know, all of these things are looking favorable. There are plenty of schools around us in our, in our very near by districts that have gone back to full day. Um, and so, we, we have the things in place, I think I feel to handle um, more kids being back and, and having that full experience. And I know that, you know, mental health has been seriously on the rise. There are some staggering statistics out there of kids, um, you know, struggling. And it's more, it's more than just mental health. It's also struggling with anxiety and depression, all of that. And I know we, we can handle this together. Great, candidate Lurch. Thank you for the question. Um, it, it's important because we all want kids to go back to school. I mean, you know, I, I work full time. I work for, my wife works full time. Like everybody else, our kids need to be in school. Um, we've done some great things on the board. Um, I was in the group that uh, talked about the testing that we started. You know, we have surveillance testing now. Um, we have, uh, uh, we've made it available for the teachers to be uh, vaccinated. So we're going to continue with the mitigations that we've got. Um, we've done testing in order to make it possible for, you know, return to normalcy, um, what it was before, we have to make people comfortable with sending their kids back to school. So we have to continue the testing, we have to continue the mitigation, and we have to be open with our communication uh, to make sure that those families who are choosing to keep their kids home now feel more comfortable sending them back so we can get back to all day in person like, like everybody wants. Candidate New Router, your thoughts? Uh, so the short answer is as soon as possible. Um, uh, like, like we know, everybody knows new, new guidance comes out all the time. Um, we do need stability uh, for the kids' education. I know my kids can't go back and forth with different plans, so we need to do it uh, smartly and methodically. Um, so I think as soon as we can open up full day, five days, even for some, 
with, uh, with our resources and with the district size and everything, then do it. Um, I know this district cannot though, with a third of the students not coming back yet, even for hybrid. Um, these parents, they don't want their kids back yet, despite our dis district vastly out outperforming other districts in terms of, terms of safety. So we need to build that trust through communicating with parents uh, so they know exactly how safe it is to go back and so they can make an informed choice and then hopefully they'll find it is safe and then send their kids back as much as possible and we can do it with the resources we have. Candidate Nunez. I think there's no question from anybody um, that's here on this panel or in our community that we know that teachers and students belong in the classroom. That's without question. The real question is how, uh, how and when that happens. And while we're highly, highly encouraged um, with the new guidelines that are out, these are the reasons why we have switched to a more expanded in-person um, learning opportunity beginning March 22nd. Uh, in response to those um, guidelines and the, the relaxed mitigations that we saw coming down the pike. So we are uh, pleased to be able to do that. I think what is important to remember is that although this seems like an incredibly simple uh, uh, issue here, it's not as easy as just flipping the switch and transitioning from one modality to another. There's an incredible amount of planning and effort um, and uh, things to consider in making any kind of transition. It affects every single stakeholder that we have in place here. Um, and it requires a lot of uh, work and thought on capacity, on being consistent with what we said we were going to do, having a consistent educational environment and making sure that 100% of our students are being supported. Okay. We're gonna have to move on, but thank you. All right, next question. And it is similar, but a little bit different. So we're gonna begin with candidate Benning. Throughout the pandemic, the health professionals such as the CDC and IDPH have updated their guidance. As a board member, how would you decide when to follow their guidance and when to forego the recommendations in order to move towards school as normal? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is uh, they are the health professionals. I am not a health professional. I am not a scientist. I'm going to follow the science that is involved. And I think the research and the studies have shown it's more impactful for children to be back in school on a regular basis and extended hours than it is for them to be remote. Um, so again, we're always gonna follow the science. When would I not follow the science? That's putting my opinion and my personal opinion above the science, which is one thing I will not do. Um, I think that there wasn't research when we were making decisions nine months ago, and that's not the fault of the board. I think more and more studies are coming out on a regular basis. And I think we just need to act sooner with those studies um, to make sure that we are at the forefront of education rather than reactive. All right, candidate Kemp, when would yes. you forego the recommendations of the experts to move towards school as normal? Well, I think it was initially said, how would we decide to follow the, the guidance? And I do believe it is important to follow all the guidance um, to, the best of our, to the best extent possible. And to keep in mind that the, this is guidance put forth um, and it is not mandates. So we, everything I, I believe, if we're being critical thinking and uh, thinking outside the box, we have to be willing that to, to understand that there's a give and take, right? We're gonna follow the guidance to the best of our, to the best extent possible. We have safety mitigations in place, but I think it's so important to address the pressing issue of that kids are suffering right now. There are kids, there are, you, you can look at that there's a third people who are still in full remote, but there's a multitude of reasons why that exists. Some couldn't handle the severe reduction in learning time being dropped to two hours and 15 minutes. And so, and people needed that set. Some people, both parents are essential workers. They had to have something constant in place to, to, to care for their kids. And there are people who had lost money in the shutdown. So they didn't have the right. resources. Thank you. Candidate Lurch. So I don't really believe that there is a time where you can ignore the experts. Um, in the district, we have always uh, followed the advice of the, the health experts in, in this case, you know, uh, in the other, um, in the other situations that we had to deal with, we, we dealt with the population experts and the financial experts. And in this case, it's the health experts. So we always refer, uh, we always defer 
to the information provided by experts. Um, now, even among the experts, they have differing opinions, but we, we are always going to protect the health and safety of our students, staff in the community in this district. And if it means that we wait a little bit longer before we ease up our restrictions, then, then that's the way it's gonna be because that's what's safest and that's what's best practice uh, to make sure that everybody is protected. You know, I'd love to send my, my son back to school, you know, all day, five days a week, um, but it's not safe to do so. So, and, and you know, I'm not gonna roll the dice with, with my family. I'm not gonna roll the dice with anybody else's family. All right, candidate new router, your thoughts? Um, yeah, so I, I also don't think you can um, really uh, ignore health professionals' advice during a pandemic. Um, yeah, and, and, and CDC and IDPH, they, they do provide guidance, um, but it's important to know that they, it's generalized because they cannot describe every situation. Each school difference different, each district has different uh, resources, they have different communities spread. So what we can do and what the district has already done is bring in local experts to help understand, uh, build a local plan uh, so that we can continue to keep our kids safe. Um, we, we have to, and, and in order to under, help communities and uh, the families feel safer about it, we have to communicate all maybe more options uh, uh, that so that they know which ones are not chosen and why. And so that you can build that trust uh, as to why we need to follow the experts advice. All right, candidate Nunez. Yes, uh, Jay and Steve, I think uh, you, you now have beat me to the punch. So <laughs> um, I, I think it's important that the community knows um, that uh, in, uh, as a board member, there will never be a, a time in a global pandemic where I will ignore the, the guidelines of a health expert. When the stakes are as high as they are um, in that kind of environment, um, it, as was mentioned earlier, I'm not going to gamble on, on, on moving away from those guidelines. That's number one. Number two, I wanted to uh, underscore that what we have here in District 89, what we enjoy in terms of strong fiscal responsibility and high academic achievement, it's because um, your leadership values the guidelines, not just the requirements, not just the compliance. We, uh, we look at best practices and we look at uh, the ec educational experts and otherwise. So that's uh, a value I think that you have had in this current board and prior. And then where do you stop there? Where do you stop ignoring guidelines? Thank you. Candidate Sridhar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would definitely touch on similar thoughts that you heard from um, Heidi, Jay, and Steve. But I want to really um, emphasize that one size does not fit all. Absolutely, they are guidelines. But I think we need to make the right mindful, meaningful, thoughtful decisions for our school district. And within our school district, every school has different requirements. So as we think about it, we've got to look at the guidelines and marry it to our um, what we can achieve and what we can try. Um, having said that, I am a believer um, in following the guidelines, in reviewing the guidelines and keeping that as our guide to drive our uh, decisions. And I think um, the other point I will echo is um, we have to think about the health and safety of everybody involved in the educational process and also what that has an impact on our community. So I think really keeping in mind holistically, uh, I think is really critical in our decisions in following the guidelines. And we've done a really good job of ensuring where we look at the guidelines and where we make decisions relative to um, our schools. Okay. Uh, now we're going to move away from discussing the pandemic and begin with candidate Kemp. What is your opinion of the security and safety measures in our schools? Are any changes needed? Okay. So the security and safety measures of our schools, I mean, clearly we, I, I feel they've done a good job. They have, like I said, the five, if not six layers of mitigation um, to ensure you know, minimizing the risks that are out there. And, you know, children have always felt safe coming to school. In fact, when we, as a teacher, when we dealt with, you know, active shooter drills, one of the things we had to say to our students is schools are one of the safest places to be, 
right? So that shouldn't change, you know, just because we're in a pandemic. I think that schools are a safe place to be. And in fact, for, for people who have been struggling and maybe are on the lower income spectrum, you know, this is where they have received the most benefits and the most services is when they're in school, which is why I encourage that fuller time, fuller experience of being in person and in instruction. So I feel like, you know, we need to get these kids back in school and the safety measures are there. All right, candidate Lurch, your opinion on security and safety measures in the schools? Security and safety measures, are, are you, I'm sorry, just for some clarification, are you talking about against the pandemic or in, in no, that's, no, that's what I No, I think this is a different question. Okay, okay. So really, you know, when I was in school, we used to have tornado drills. Um, it, it really, it broke my heart in kindergarten when my son came home and told me that he had an active shooter drill. It really did. Um, our schools are safe. Our schools are safe. I mean, they're, you know, the doors are double locked. You have to get buzzed in. Uh, you have to sign in a sheet. You have to, even if, you, you know, you go into every office, all the, all this, we've taken a lot of steps to make sure that in the construction of the school buildings themselves, that they are, um, that they are safe. At Arborview, you can come in and, and there's that vestibule there and every door will lock if it's an emergency, you know, and it's the same in all the other schools. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, the time that we live in requires that type of um, that type of extreme lockdown situation. So, I mean, you know, we're we're proactive in the district. We think ahead. Uh, we don't react to things when they happen, and that's why we do live in such a safe district. So, all right, thank you, candidate New Router. So, um, see, I, I, you know, I, I don't like the the fact that the kids have to do active shooter drills. But the but the the reality is that you know I, I think it's necessary and I think from what I understand and uh, I'm not an expert in this but I from what I've heard um, the different ways they do it um, it is appropriate for each uh, age and so um, as best it can be I guess um, so um, I haven't heard of anything any reason to think the security um, or these types of uh, drills are uh, deficient in any way, but I am, you know, if I'm elected to be school board member, um, I'll be completely open to anyone who sees any problems, and uh, I take it extremely seriously, um, and I would do everything I can to make sure the kids are safe, because that's, that's the first, that's the highest priority above even education. You can't go to school without feeling welcome and safe. Okay, candidate Nunez, your views on security and safety measures in our schools. Yes. Um, in my opinion, before the pandemic, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, we know students can't learn and teachers can't teach unless they feel safe to do so. This is an important issue for the board and for myself personally. I can tell you when I first joined the board, this, is, this was a big conversation and making sure that we were going through and thinking through uh, um, the safety measures in each of the building, as Jay mentioned, double locking doors, what are the accessibility points and things like that. So I think one of the things that the community needs to know um, is that, um, you know, the prior board absolutely has taken a look at um, where we are in terms of safety for our students and our teachers in the buildings. It continues to be an important issue. I agree with um, uh, the candidates here that this is a, um, an unfortunate period in our young children's lives where they have to go through this kind of preparation. Um, and I, I can tell you, you know, not just in our current times, but safety uh, is important to me. Students can't learn, teachers can't teach in an environment where they don't feel safe to do so. All right, candidate Sridhar. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, uh, building off what Heidi just said, I, it's super critical. I almost look at it as a funda foundational need for the children, teachers and the administrators to feel safe and secure. Um, we, yes, we do have tough times where, you know, the kids have to go through shooter drill, but we really feel proud that from a fiscal perspective, we have definitely prioritized safety measures, the double door, the double lock doors, the vestibules, or even cameras to really make sure that we have, uh, you know, all the protection needed. 
And also I want to build on that we have built those community and I've always said community interaction is important. So we've got a really strong lead, uh, foundation and connections with our police department, with our um, different other you know, safe, safety resources in the community to really make sure that there is that conversations uh, of the students and the teachers and the board with our community. And then lastly, I think beyond just physical safety, I think uh, you know, mental safety, mental, uh, the feelingness is really important. And I think having social workers in schools I think has been another way of really giving that full rounded physical, social, emotional. I'm sorry, I have um, to, to cut you students. off, but thank, thank you. you. And lastly, candidate Benning. Hope you're muted. My there apologies. That's I took this question a little bit differently. Um, I think we all know our schools are very physically safe. Um, we hope our God, we never have to put, have an active shooter in our schools, but we, I think we know where they're protected. What this pandemic has done, and it breaks my heart, especially as a foster parent and as someone who has got call after call to take these children, these children have not been safe. And I think we're naive to think just because we are in Glen Ellen and Wheaton that there's not children suffering right now from a mental and emotional and abuse state in their home environments. They aren't getting the meals. Several, we have so many children, 30% of our children getting free and reduced meals that what if their parents aren't picking up those packages, right? They're still not getting fed. And what about the abuse that's happening that the teachers were the number one reporters in abuse for families and that is currently not being able to happen on a consistent basis. The statistics are staggering and I believe that this safety of the school is really the safety of the children and that's one area that does concern me of why children need to be more in school because they is their outlet. Okay, um, I'd like to try to squeeze in one more question. Um, so, so yes, you have a minute, but if you could be brief, that would be great. Um, so here's the, the last question. What can District 89 do to move forward on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives? And we begin with candidate Lurch. So, you know, we just finished the equity audit. And so one of the things we can do is try and farm uh, more diverse uh, staff and leadership um, from those schools that are more like our community that we live in, you know? So uh, I think, what is it, 80% of the um, uh, teachers in the district are, are white uh, and that's not representative of our community. And so we need to do a better job of recruiting teachers uh, and principals uh, and, and leaders uh, from other areas uh, to make it more diverse. That's how we get better. All right, candidate new router. Um, so I think, um... You know, teachers need to understand differences uh, of, of each of the student groups uh, in, in, our, in our district. Um, we need to have students' voices heard more. Um, we need to um, continue to try to reach out to the community members, so specifically the parents. We need to um, have the parents and the teachers work together to, um, to improve uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So. Um, a combination of factors uh, that need, needs to happen and a lot of it has to do with communication. Um, yeah, that's, that's. All right, candidate Nunez. Yes, um, I, this is an area where I feel incredibly positive about the work that we're doing in District 89. Um, I'll tell you that for the large part of my career, uh, and I'm gonna date myself here, over 20 years I've been working on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives across a number of different types of organizations. And I feel very strongly that District 89 is well positioned and has um, the essential elements in place to move initiatives forward. We've taken an incredible first step and the most important first step, and that is uh, understanding ourselves with this uh, diversity, uh, this equity audit um, that we initiated a few years ago. And actually even prior to that, we were already looking at disaggregating our achievement data and taking a look at which populations we um, need to be uh, providing additional intervention or prevention measures for. So that's number one is really understanding where the need is. And I think the next thing that we have in place that's gonna drive success measures forward is the commitment um, from leadership administration and, uh, and all stakeholders across the board, teachers, um, principals, et cetera, we're, they're all committed to seeing um, some of the change that was identified in the diversity audit. So I think that's where we are and I feel good about it. Okay, and candidate Sridhar. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really critical topic. It was always a critical topic before the pandemic, but I think during the pandemic too, I think diversity and equity um, is definitely a key pillar for us moving forward. Um, as uh, Jay and Heidi mentioned, the equity audit is a one step to really unlocking uh, what are some of our gaps that we need to uh, really address. And I, I do believe uh, that I think we are moving in the right direction. We really got all the right resources to push that. And I'm fully as a board member supportive of it in the past and will continue to do that to really get uh, empowering students, teachers and the community from an equity and diversity uh, perspective. Thank you. Candidate Benning. Yeah, I'm really proud that the district was proactive in, in doing an equity report um, and using the, the numbers and data to drive an action plan, making sure that we follow through with that action plan. We need to, again, recruit, cast a wider net, and we need the support of the community to recruit more diverse teachers. It doesn't just take the administration, it takes everyone to do that. I also think we need to make sure that we are educating our teachers on celebrating cultural differences and making sure that our children can bring their authentic selves to school every single day. That builds confidence in our children, our generation. It also helps build resilience with them when they know that they can be trusted and supported and bring their differences. It also helps this next generation understand each other's differences so that they can respect each other more. And I think our district is on the right path. And finally, candidate Kemp. Yes. Um, you know, one of the main things that we were encouraged by moving here is that there was a di diverse community, that there's all walks of life here with different backgrounds. And I, I like to echo what Katie said, we need to be celebrating those diverse cultures, we need to be committed to engaging those different voices. Um, that's, that's to me what diversity is about. And I think with equity, I don't, I, I believe it's important, but I, I want to be clear that it's not about treating some people differently in order to ensure that the opportunity is the same for others. It's not a zero sum game, you know, to try and rebalance the scale. I believe in elevating every child, but not at the expense of another. And I want, I want to see us have those rich experiences and celebrating that, that, that diversity. And I think that can be done, you know, one of the, if low-income um, families are, I feel have been really hard hit in this pandemic. And so how have we been doing? Where's our outreach and surveying how those kids are doing right now? That's to me tapping into- I gotta into cut that. you off, but thank you. So, so I want to thank all the candidates for answering our questions. Now we're going to move into the closing statements. I remind you that you each have one minute, and we're going to begin with candidate New Router. Hi, um, I'm running to keep our schools great and ensure all kids, all kids are getting the best education they can with the resources in our, our community gives them. I, I know how to do this. I've done this for years in my career. Uh, I also know the district. I know the community. I know the balance we need to make between the community, the district and each family's needs. I have the skills to help achieve this balance. Uh, to do this, I will focus my efforts on making sure the district has the direction and resources so kids, teachers, district staff can go back to school safely. I will make sure the district continues its excellent academic achievement and continues its progress on making kids feel, feel welcome through diversity, equity and inclusion efforts. I will make sure that the district continues to be fiscally responsible I will make sure that the district is clear about these topics so parents are informed what is happening in our schools. And again, um, I'm Stephen Neurouter and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And next closing statement, candidate Nunez. Yes, it's been my honor to serve the, uh, on the District uh, 89 Board of Education for the past six years. And I'm running for re-election today for the same reason that I volunteered six years ago. Service is important to me, particularly in the community where I'm living and raising my family. It would be my honor to continue to serve um, on the board um, again for the next four years um, and continue to uh, fulfill in fulfillment of the district's mission to empower all learners to recognize and optimize their full potential. I feel strongly that my experience over the past six years and being involved in the decision-making over the past year in particular um, will be assets and uh, moving us forward to the 2021-2022 school year and beyond. Um, and I, I think that in me, you can continue to um, count on a leader that 
uh, leads with integrity, that uh, is collaborative um, and understands the value of um, data and strong policy. I'm very encouraged in the groundswelling of support for local elections and civic engagement. And I wanna encourage everybody to vote on April 6th and please cast one of your four votes for Heidi Munez. Okay, closing statement, candidate Sridhar. Uh, thank you again, uh, Barbara and the team for giving this opportunity for the forum, I appreciate it. Um, uh, as an incumbent, um, you know, we've all heard like the great work the board has been doing. I promise the community, the parents that I will continue uh, to bring kind of uh, the, my service to the board, really driving kind of dependable, stable leadership, really ensuring that we are driving a comprehensive and continuous learning uh, environment for our students and really making sure that we have fiscal stability, that we can really make sure that we are uh, providing uh, all the right education for the full student and really driving uh, their full comprehensive and continuous uh, learning. Again, I really appreciate the opportunity. And as a local vote, please go vote for Lavanya Sridhar on uh, April 6th. And again, thank you for your support and um, look forward to serving on the board for another four years. Thank you. All right, candidate Benning, your closing statement. Yeah, thank you very much again for hosting this. I think this was a great forum. I feel very confident in even the other candidates if they are elected that we're gonna have the strongest board that is gonna represent our community. Um, I am very excited for what the future holds. I think that we've had some great conversation. I think that if I was elected and working with these board members, um, we would be able to collaborate. We'd be able to challenge each other in a healthy way. We'd also be able to drive transparency and communication trust within the community. I really wanna just thank you guys for your time today. And I just wanna say, get out there and vote. Um, our voices need to be heard. Our children deserve that. And I look forward to it um, and have a great day. Thank you. Candidate Kemp, your closing statement. Yes, likewise. Thank you to everyone partaking in this today. And I just want to reiterate, I'm Donna Kemp. I'm a child-centered advocate. I'm education-based. I'm business-minded. I'm family-focused and solution-oriented. And I really feel like my well-rounded experience and background has demonstrated my ability to represent our wide ranging community voice, including the parents and teachers. I feel I've demonstrated my belief in public education, especially my teaching background, you know, with a focus on continued improvement and really my commitment to teamwork. I think that's important in collaborating with all of our stakeholders. I believe in our district's core values. Uh, the three that I wanna emphasize are the partnership with home, school and community really rebuilding that, are holding the high expectations for all our students, but also for all our stakeholders, and really it, that high level of satisfaction that we seek out. I wanna make sure that we are doing that and addressing the fact that there may be, being willing to look at there may have been a dip in those satisfactions. Okay, and our final word comes from candidate Lurch. Thank you, Barbara. And thanks again to the League of Women Voters. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with everybody. Uh, it's nice to kind of see all the interest uh, in our community. So it's encouraging. And I look forward to the next four years uh, as a school board member. Uh, the reason I, I, I ran prior and, and I'm running again is because, you know, I see the quality education my son is getting from Arborview Elementary. And I want to I feel a responsibility to make sure that the other kids in the district can get that same level of, of high education. You know, the district's vision for excellence includes engaging in innovative problem solving, critical thinking and effective collaboration. And that's what we do on the board. Uh, we enable self-sufficiency, responsibility, and accountability, and we encourage empathy, acceptance, and self-efficiency. So, I mean, we really embrace the strengths in our differences as members of a global community. And that's what you know, I think we have a strong board that 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 meets uh, a lot of that vision for excellence, and I'd like to continue with that. So I hope you'll vote for Lurch. Thanks. All right. So thank you, candidates. Your participation is now complete. Please stop your video. And our time is up for this morning's forum. I want to thank those of you who are either attending or watching it afterward after it's recorded. We appreciate your participation, whether you're a candidate or a voter. For 100% nonpartisan election information, 
you can go to the IllinoisVoterGuide.org, which is powered by the League of Women Voters of Illinois, or visit the Glen Ellen League website, lwvge.org, where you'll find a recording of this forum. Please come back and join us on March 20th for our remaining candidate forums, and please do vote. It's essential to our freedom 